Good afternoon. Welcome to May. Everyone has a voice. Um, we have a very intimate gathering today. Our features are here. Um, Anita D will be our feature, and Delor Ihad um, will be our student feature. Uh, and I would like to start off with my poem. So last week at this time, I was on my way to my high school reunion, uh, 50 years uh, when I graduated, plus one year because I graduated in 71. So when I got home that night, I wrote the poem for the gathering um, of the reunion. And it's called May 14th, 5 p.m. to 11 p.m., 50-year high school reunion. We are in the true years of our lives. Can you relive the past? For one glorious night we shed our yokes, the years of striving to be, heaviness of the air wearing us like the weight of the world, the stories we hold within us. Our past, black and white, the shadows of grayness cover us like a blanket against the obscurities of light, what secrets bind us as we, yearn, as we yearn nostalgic, marking off each page of the calendar, our roadmap to accomplishment and disappointment imprinted in our stream of consciousness. We anticipate the gathering, feel the colors of the music, the lightness of dance, our bodies flowing, remembering First dance, first kiss, the touch that made us weak in the knees. We turn yesterday into today, reflections in this moment, tomorrow waiting to treasure remembrance. Hey bartender, one for my good friend, make it two. We are reborn swallowed up in the frenzy, memories, hugs, accepting firm handshakes, and the smiles with no hidden agendas. In unison, we sing for each other, to each other, the melodies of our being intertwined. We are the river flowing into the sea. See the ripples of each heartbeat beating as one. The ripple turns into a wave carrying us as dawn awakens, shedding its night skin, gives herself to blue warm silk, dreams form, hands cup memories, release. We transcend, contemplate, and find new meaning of our past, how we are connected like water and earth, the whisper of the wind caresses us. One last time, we turn receptive to the delicate mist that drapes the last goodbye until you make me want to shout, kick my heels up, and... So, that was a 50-year reunion poem. So I would like to introduce, we have a special guest today uh, from Brockton High School. Meredith Nussbaum, she was featured, uh, one of the features in our Educator Showcase. So let's give a warm welcome to Meredith Nussbaum. You kissed me like the last time I knew how to breathe. You pulled me in like a daydream, caught me like a bull in a butterfly net. You traced the line of my hip bone like you were trying to learn how to draw me. You move so carefully because I think that maybe you wanted to impress me, but you don't know I would be pleased with whatever masterpiece you made me. You are something I've never seen before, and baby, I've seen it all. I've, without words, you say everything I needed to hear, everything I forgot because I made myself small enough to fit between the cracks in someone else's broken life. I let myself become crooked and bent, jagged and jaded, but you make me want to be whole. You make me want to cry out, make me want to say it with every ounce of air I have left in these lungs. 
make me want to pry open my rib cage and say, here, this, this is me. But right now I can't. Instead, I will stay silent, keeping you confined to the lines of this poem. I'm afraid that if I say your name, it will drift from my lips like smoke, ephemeral, feeble. Instead, I will say it out loud to myself in the dark. I will say it with all the sound of the clouds as they crawl across the sky. Shout it as loud as a moonbeam. Sing it as sweet as sunshine. I will speak your name with the voice of the stars. Endless, brilliant. I will murmur it between my heartbeats. I will mutter it between the steps in my stride. I will whisper it in Morse code in the flutters of my eyelashes. I will blink your name to strangers and they will never know who you are to me because I'm not ready to open myself up to the rest of the world. I'm not ready to let them see my knotted heart as it begins to entangle. I'm not ready to answer the question, do you love her? How can I tell them that I can still feel your lips pressed against my collarbone when you're not around? How can I tell them that your hands feel like home to me? How can I tell them that you make me believe in magic? How can I tell them the truth? Right now, all I can say is, I don't know, maybe. This next poem is belief. I'm a god, she says. Sitting on a rock surrounded by the ocean, sir, her arms open, a wingspan wide enough to hide the moon. She stands, her feet bare, foot and bleeding. She walks like the rest of us after all over jagged rocks and broken seashells. She is truly a sight to behold. Divine in the way her salt streaked hair hangs from her scalp like seaweed. Holy in the way her sun-kissed lips wrap themselves around the words, I am a god, she says. Standing on a rock surrounded by the open sky, the air around her shivers. As if every breeze begs to slide over her sea so skin, skin her each zephyr's caress across water slick limbs draws up goosebumps. She does not shiver. She draws in the air in around her, pulls them into mighty lungs. I am a god, she says. She lifts her face to drink another shot of sunshine. The light clings to her lips, sticky and sweet, soaks deep into her bones, heals her immortal wounds. I'm a god, she says. And this time, she believes it. I have one more for you. Uh, and this is a very old, very dear poem to me. The cosmos stretched wide when I reached my arms around you. A universe once was here, measured in moments and smiles and tears. But even through the darkness of space, sunlight still finds the face of the full moon. Miles away, I drift through a lonely longing to find a song worth singing, cause here, nobody's beating heart pleads faintly for another. Here, there's no failure or gaining the strength I need to stand, because without you, I can still see you. In the stars, and I connect with lines, I find the curve of your spine, the angle of your jaw. And in the constellations I draw, I saw you smiling. Somewhere, dust becomes beautiful rings around a planet spinning around its own sun as I'm reeling, kneeling, alone at my bedside. I wonder how I can pray. But I could mention to let you know we still exist in the same dimension, because here, the dust settles and whispers in the places you won't stay. And in that quiet, perfect silence, I can almost hear you say, hey, I miss you. Lovely and lingering in the spaces you don't see, I can find anything there but me while you drift your comet tail, trailing a path so glorious it burns out my eyes because I can't tear them away. Because you're still glorious even when I'm losing from my orbit and I admit that I want to be your satellite and that I just might take the risk of getting too close to being incinerated in your, in your atmosphere. But that's less than the fear of our worlds dividing. I'd rather be colliding full force Armageddon into your heart and mind. Our bodies combine into a supernova so red hot, everything around us melts away. But instead, a black hole forms here and celestial storms transform this once cozy corner of our galaxy into a nightmare macrocosm spiraling out of control. And I told myself this would happen. I just didn't know when. I didn't know back then when we started. With this big bang that rang out in a deafening roar the first time my heart started beating for you. The first time I saw you. The first time the cells on our lips touched and I could feel the pulse of your heart, the capillaries in my skin, feel it drumming, humming, becoming everything within. I could feel those reactions, tying oxygen to oxygen. 
It bound our breath together and made me realize my mitochondria and mitochondria images imagined only by the shivering of your shimmering photons as they fall from grace, but I can't retrace the lines that shine there. But I can still feel the heat that rises from the vibration of your molecules and the proteins that form there perform the feats needed to keep you alive. And I know I can say deoxyribonucleic acid until my tongue bleeds, but your DNA still says wonderful things about you. I wonder if maybe I can climb that genetic ladder way to the top to where I think the gene for love is and switch it back on, but maybe it's not something so small. Maybe the stars aren't showing the right sign. Maybe Mars and Saturn need to realign or Venus needs to complete a rotation for the sensation of passion to be restored to us now, but somehow, I know. No matter how many fallen eyelashes I wish on or no matter how many shooting stars I see, it's over, you're done. You don't love me. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. That was wonderful. Um, so we are going to introduce our student feature. His name is Delore Ihadi. He's 18 years old from Boston. He's 18 years old from Boston. He moved to Brockton when he was eight years old. A student at Southeastern Regional High School. He tried poetry once in the seventh grade, but didn't have the mind of a creative artist. Then a few years later, he wrote a poem with the help of his teacher, Mr. Fernandez, about identity. They loved my poem, which inspired him to strengthen his creative mind and express himself. He participated in different things other than his passion for poetry. He's been active in after-school drama program. As a student at the Plyff Academy, he helped at the Dedham and Holbrook Food Pantry. He has also been involved in esports and has taken a dual enrollment in speech class, earning him a three college credits from Massasoit Community College. He received an honorable mention for his poem, which was published in the Boston Globe. Now, he wants to unlock his creativity and inspire others to express their identities. Please welcome Delore Ihadi. My name is Delore Ihadi. Now, before I'll be presenting a poem, I just want you guys to know that, that all of my five poems will will show the story about growing up and how we see childhood and adulthood. So first, I'll be presenting a poem called A Childlike Dream. A dream without strife, filled with melodies of life. It's like heaven's light we might, as we see the world filled with peace, we thought it might last forever with ease. But as, if, but as the flow of time corrupted, the dream that we once knew fades into the shadows without aid. The dream we once knew has become a memory, no melody or peace as tender be. Now I'll be presenting a poem called The Two Sides of the Brain. Our youth is like being on the left, left side of the brain, beauty, Wonder, happiness, and innocence in our game. Colorful, brilliant, shining like a star. Seek our imaginations from afar. But as adulthood reigns, there is the other side of the brain. Dark, melancholic, as it remained. The world we once knew 
Coldly blend is long gone as it came to an end. And now, now on to the next poem, The Nostalgia of Childhood. A time's beginning comes a youth that is within us with no ruth. Our voices are like the whispers of the song, showing us the message that nothing can go wrong. Blended with color, as beautiful as it might, their voices shining like a light. As we see our youth of nostalgia within, we see a light of our grin. Now on to the darker part, the melancholy of adulthood. There's a world, a world that is filled with pain that extinguishes the light we cannot regain. Black and gray, dreadfully bland, darkness that reigns with no end. With no hope to seek, the lighting, the lighting expires. Replaced with regret, with no desires. The voices cry, filled with sorrow that can be heard even on the morrow. The eyes stress, filled with pain, carrying the heavy burden that rain. Now, on to, to the final part, a melodic youth. Our childhood is like a melody, a melody of light that is heard from within we might. Hear the melodies of life, hear the waves of the voice that has ascended from the skies, we might rejoice. A malign nostalgia that is made with memories will last forever, even in a century. A song within shine our hearts, telling us that nothing would tell us apart. But as time flows, a melody fades, like a dust for the rest of the days. Darkness reigns, pl plague spreads, a, a melody dying as its blood is shed. A melody is like a symbol, a symbol of hope that dies so fast, we cannot cope. Growing up is cruel, like the melody's death. We said farewell as it took its last breath. Thank you. Thank you, Delore. Our future is in very good hands. So now it is my pleasure, absolutely, to introduce our feature poet for the afternoon. She is Anita D., a nationally ranked spoken word artist and slam poet born and raised in Brockton. Her work has a heavy focus on personal narrative and generational healing. She also uses her platform to spread awareness for mental health awareness and women's safety in the community. Anita is a two-time member of the San Diego Slam Team and one-time mem member of the House Slam Team of Boston. She was a National Poet Slam finalist in 2016, a semi-finalist in 2018, and placed third as, individual, as an individual World Poetry Slam finalist in 2019. 
Her work has been featured on Button, All Deaf Poetry, Fox Soul, and Slam Find. Anita is a mother, a mentor, an advocate, and currently working on her first published full-length book with Button Poetry. Please give a warm welcome for Anita D. Thank you, thank you. How's everybody feeling today? I know there's only like 11 of us in here, but we, we gonna have a little bit of energy. How's everybody feeling today? Yeah. That's, see, I, I knew you had it in you. I knew you had it in you. Um, thank you so much for having me and inviting me here. Um, I just want to appreciate all uh, the three of you for your work, um, your passion, your imagery, um, your everything, sir. I'm just very appreciative of being here. Um, so thank you so much. I have a few poems. Um, I'm going to cover a few different topics, if that's OK. Um, I'm going to be honest and transparent before I get into my poetry, though, because I've been struggling with this all day. I have. Um, I deal with things, it is Mental Health Awareness Month, so it's appropriate for me to speak on this, I feel. Um, I do deal with uh, heavy anxiety and uh, depression, postpartum depression, and for some reason, today, I have been fighting an anxiety attack like all day, and I was just like in my car, that's why I was just like a few minutes late. Um, so I've been fighting that all day, but I'm gonna push through it, um, so if you hear any nerves, just, um, Put it, give it to that, it's, it's that, blame it on that. Um, but we got this. So the first poem I'm gonna do is called I Am. It's a bit of a, an introduction. Um, it's an older piece, but um, I like it. I think it's not bad. Um, I am one of the most sensitive people I know. I start to cry whenever an abandoned animal commercial comes on TV or pops up on my timeline. I break down whenever I hear a song about heartbreak or love or God. It always sounds like what I'm going through or what I want or the relationship I need. I am your typical hopeless romantic a flower blooming in either a desert or a blizzard, which is to say I am not a product of my environment, but rather one of resilience. I am as stubborn as I am passionate, as poor as I am wealthy, and I see value in everything. I live vulnerably behind a short wall draped in barbed wire. I built it to protect myself, but I maintain it because I am too afraid to not have a place to hide. I am no coward, but I have fears. I am afraid I have more questions than I will ever have answers, that I forgive other people more often than I forgive myself. Therefore, I love other people before I am able to love myself. I am afraid of the dark, but I'm obsessed with the moon and the stars. They remind me that hope is something you don't always see, but it is always there. I am one in every five women, only a portion of the woman I could have been. But too many parts of me have been taken and touched against my will. I am too tarnished to recognize myself some days. Every mirror looks broken to me. Every mirror holds my reflection. I miss who I used to be, but I'm trying to love who I am becoming. I know that every time I cry is proof I am surviving. I know that every time I smile is proof that flowers bloom in deserts and in blizzards. And I know that the moon and the stars will not always be there when I look up. But I will always look for them when it gets dark. Thank you. That's the first poem. Y'all can clap and stuff. It's OK. Yeah, no, that's fine. I like, I like energy, so even if like through the poems, if you hear a line that like hits you, or if, you know, let me know, let me know. Um, I love it, express it. So I smiled extra big when I said the line in the poem. Um, I am a mother, I have a 10, mo 10 month old son who thinks he's a year and a half going on two, um, and his name is Moon. And I wrote this poem years ago, but I've just always been obsessed with the moon. So I named him Moon, and that's my baby. 
Um, so I just wanted to shout him out. He's at home with his nana. Um, okay, this next poem. Let me get some water. Uh, so, the late, great, marvelous Marvin Hagler. Um, his birthday is in two days. And I was fortunate enough to know Marvin Hagler, to meet him. I am fortunate enough to know his family, to know his mother, um, his siblings, niece, all the nieces and nephews, their family so big. <laughs> and um, last summer, I was pregnant. I was about eight months pregnant. <laughs> and we did, not we, I was just a performer in it, but there was a tribute to Marvin Hagler that was held at Brockton High School at the stadium. Um, I was fortunate enough to perform um, at a poem in honor of Marvin Hagler. And because his birthday is in two days, I would like to perform that poem um, in honor of him and his memory. So I'm really parched. I'm just going to drink water real quick. Y'all feeling good? Yeah. OK, yeah. yay. OK. To be marvelous means to be extraordinary, to cause wonder or astonishment. Oftentimes, the word is, is used to describe works of art or artistic performances. Marvin Hagler was indeed a marvel, a true artist of the craft. At a young age, his curiosity for boxing led him to the Petronelli Gym he entered an empty canvas with an inquisitive determination and soon became, began to sketch himself a legacy, mold himself into a monarch. One could argue that the fighter he was sculpted into was, curate, was a curated masterpiece. With quick, heavy strokes of that southpaw jab, he made a living painting the ring floor with his opponents. Every time the bell rang, he went to war battled toward victory in each round, stood like statue after every knockout. His precision is perhaps one of the best the world has ever witnessed, a true undisputed champion. But this poem is not just a commemoration of a boxing legend, it is a celebration of the person behind the gloves, a truly undisputed man, a husband, a brother, a father, a son whose fighting spirit exceeded far past these four corners of a boxing ring, whose greatest title he ever held was a promise he kept to make his mother proud. That win is a title no split decision could ever dispute. Marvin Hagler was undoubtedly the greatest, a true wonder and astonishment, almost magical. As we gather today to give honor to this champion, let us also take away a bit of inspiration to mold ourselves into a masterpiece of our own. When given a challenge, let us choose the uphill battle, then win anyway. Let us never leave anything up for someone else to judge. I implore us all, become the greatest. Be a legend, and above all, be marvelous. Okay, okay, we're gonna get a little, a little, a little heavy. Is that okay? Um, I so my, my work uh, is a lot about personal narrative, and for me, poetry is therapy. It's healing. It's my journal. It's all the things I don't say out loud or to other people, um, that's what I put into, ther into poetry. Um, I'm now putting into therapy. That came out on accident, but I just started therapy, so shout out to that. Um, <laughs> um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna do a couple poems that are a little heavy, um, but I'm gonna bring it back up. So no worries, no worries. Um, this next topic covers generational healing. Halloween used to be one of my family's favorite holidays. We loved decorating the house and the yard. My dad would really get into it, and by that I mean he used to actually be a decoration. 
So he'd costume himself into a ghoulish scarecrow and then lay out on the lawn chair, wait for local trick-or-treaters to approach the house and scare the living crap out of them and me. <laughs> Some of the masks he wore were so terrifying I could barely look at him. Over the years, I noticed my family slowly stopped decorating. I'm not sure if it's because my brother and I grew older or if it's because we started to see my father turn monster more often. I mean, who needs decorations when a bottle of gin can do the trick? Be the potion or the poison that transforms a hero into a horror. Slur the tongue, the mind, and the body into a hunchback, red-eyed, staggering beast. Bring that ghoulish scarecrow back to life on every holiday, after funerals, during celebrations, on the weekends, on any given night, alcohol would creep its way into the cracks of my father's broken and create space for itself. Costume my dad into the thing that goes bump in the night, but I am learning. My father was not born a monstrosity. He did not choose to become someone that frightens me, but somewhere between my childhood and my 30s, I lost sight of who he was beneath the scary. I blamed him for my trauma, but never considered where his came from. Never wondered how terrifying his childhood may have been. The demons he was forced to face growing up or the ones he is still fighting today, like the bottles of liquor that haunt him at night, or the abuse he tried to drink away as a teen, or the feelings of abandonment, like losing your mother as a young boy. It's easy to ignore hurt when you aren't the one holding it. When the weight isn't yours to bear, it's easy to stand tall and say someone else is staggering. For years, I thought of my father, this horror, as if he was always this terrifying, as if he wasn't created by someone or something. I wonder if dressing up as a scarecrow was a metaphor the entire time. Like maybe my dad was trying to show us how easily we can be turned into monsters and remind us we always have the choice to take off the costume. I should have taken more time to lift up my father's mask, realize that underneath it all, he is still human. He is still my dad. I should have tried harder to understand why he hides behind it instead of being afraid and naming him the boogeyman. Farmers have always used scarecrows to ward off threats, to preserve the life of their crops. And so maybe my father this costume is just his way of trying to protect us. He knows there are far more scarier things in this gruesome world than he, and despite how my dad chooses to deal with his hauntings, he will always be here to defend his family. After all, we are his seeds, his crops, and ain't it a scarecrow's job to make them safe? To watch them grow and blossom and not care if the rest of the world is afraid? Thank you. I did not think I was going to get through that poem. Um. Okay. Um, I'm going to do one more poem about my dad. I have a lot of poems about my dad. We've been through a lot. Um. Oh, please pop up, easy. So, um, y'all still with me? Okay. Yeah. Yay. Um, I'm trying to think of some random stuff to talk about. So I'm going to do this in a minute. I'm going to, just because I'm looking for the poem, I'm going to talk about this. Um, so I am, I have a publishing deal with Button Poetry, if, you, if anybody knows what Button Poetry is. Um, <laughs> so I got a publishing deal with them, which is really cool. They're a really big poetry platform. Um, I have a couple poems on their platform, more that I'm going to record la uh, later on this year, hopefully. One poem went super viral, um, and I was thinking about doing that today, but I don't know if it matches the energy in the room. Um, it's intense. Uh, <laughs> but this book um, is about my stay in a psychiatric ward, and it includes poems and journal entries and um, things like that uh, from that I actually wrote while I was in the hospital, and a couple that I wrote afterwards. Um, but I have them here. I have a few here. Um, I'm just taking donations. I was selling them, but I'm really just trying to get rid of them at this point because <laughs> these are like my own personal chat books. Um, so if anybody's interested, like any donation, y'all can have a book. Um, it's not like, you know, I don't promote it as the best writing I've ever done, but it's, it's the story and the conversation behind, you know, the treatment that goes on within psychiatric wards. Um, the mistreatment, I should say, that goes on within psychiatric wards. Um, 
Who knows, maybe it will be that poem. Um, okay, where is the poem? Okay, here we go. This is a personification, or a persona poem, personification. It's my favorite kind. In the voice of my father's heart, there are 78 organs in the human body. And while each of us have our own job to do, there are five of us that are considered vital in order, whoop, in order to, uh, for the big guy to keep moving. That's the brain, lungs, liver, kidneys, and me, heart. Now, he hasn't been the most kind to us over the years. He loves his salty foods. He was a heavy drinker and smoker, so that's taken a toll on us, but he's changed his diet, put down the bottle on most nights. A few years ago, I started not doing so well. Around that same time, my youngest daughter, Anita, and Brain got into a few arguments, and they stopped talking. A stubborn thing the mind is, to latch on to anger like a cancer to be so selfish and not consider what that could do to the rest of the body. Doctors say, psychological distress can trigger weakness in the heart muscle. One day, I started to feel sluggish. I felt faint and couldn't do my job right. They diagnosed the big guy with congestive heart failure, a chronic condition with a life expectancy of less than five years, says if I don't show up for work, lungs will slowly drown in blood, legs will retain fluid and swell, hypotension will start to set in, if the big guy doesn't get help quickly, we could all be dead in a matter of hours, and now Brain won't stop thinking about memories he hasn't been able to make yet. Says it's up to me to get us there, and I'm trying, but I'm sick, and I'm not sure how much longer I have. Liver and lungs can't stop apologizing to me for their cravings over the years. They blame themselves for the damage. I remind them. It is also my job to forgive, to love despite a fault, that we are all in this together, and kidneys, Kidneys are so afraid, feel so overwhelmed every time I start to slow down when I can't find the strength to flex my valves enough. All the pressure is left on them to do the work, to filter out the overflow of trauma I will leave behind, and I break a little more for the body I was built to keep afloat. If I had the power to imagine, I would dream of a second chance, to beat from the beginning again, imagine the vital choices we could have made together to save this man, what I would give to love my family all over again or forever if I could. I talk about forgiveness for the other organs, as if my, I myself even know what it means to forgive another living thing outside of my own body, and still, I have yet to forgive Brain for his mistakes, still blame him for my own downfalls. Sometimes, I wonder if my children's hearts have taken after me. If they palpulate more anger than joy, I bet that is what actually blocks the arteries. And if the congestion of animosity and pain is the true cause of heart failure, I wonder if that means I still have time to recover, to beat beyond the deadline the doctors have given me so every day I still show up to work and hope my pulse is strong enough to let go of the past and hold on to forgiveness. I hope I'm strong enough to give the big guy a fighting chance to heal. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna read one book, one book, one poem out of the book, um, and it's short, um, and then I wanna do a poem about my mom to end it, because um, I don't have many poems about my mama, but I love it a lot. Uh, this is called 21 First Days. On the days I wake up and immediately get out of bed, I am most proud of myself. These are the mornings I celebrate. They all begin a new cycle of me breaking old habits. These are the first days I choose to fight this depression again. And they are all important. And they all count as the first day. Because it means I haven't given up yet. That I still care enough to try again and again. No matter how long I lay dormant, there will always come a day where this body shouts, I am still here. I want to move. I want to dance. I want to feel the sun hug me like she missed me. Tell her I just got lost in the dark clouds and I've missed her too. I read somewhere. It takes 21 days to break a habit. So at the end of all of my first days, I promise my body I will celebrate every try and let her know how proud I am that she still chooses to be here.
Okay, one more poem about my mama. Um, are y'all good? You with me? Yeah. Yay. Thank you. Um, um, why'd I do that? Um, so the button book, the it doesn't come out until, um, I think the projected date is October 2023. Um, so I'm still in the process of writing and editing. Um, most of the poems you've heard are gonna be in the book. Um, so that's, that's a thing. <laughs> um, this last poem is also gonna be in the book, in the last uh, chapter, I guess. It's called Mother's Lessons. My mother rarely gave lessons with lectures. She teaches by doing, not speaking. She takes action or she remains still. She has a voice, but it's often hesitant to show its face. I see the years she spent being silenced when words sometimes tremble from her lips. She doesn't know it, but I smile every time she speaks up for herself. When her voice is scared, but it shows up anyway. I say to myself, so that's where I get it from. My mother taught me about taking initiative, how to lead a household by always doing, despite what any man says or doesn't do. She taught me the importance of cleaning your home, how sometimes you may have to pick up the same mess over and over and over again, but if you, keep, if you want to keep your home, you'll keep cleaning up the blood. You'll keep begging your husband and daughter to stop fighting and praying that both of them will stop drinking eventually. My mother taught me I'm choosing to stay, taught me about choosing to stay in love, understanding that staying means you, may all may, you will not always be happy but if you want your family, if you want your home, you will make the choice. She taught me that a family is something you never stop creating. A house filled with a stepfather and half siblings and is no less a family and is no less a home. She taught me that becoming a single mother means I get to paint my family portrait as colorful as I choose. My mother is teaching me how to be a mom now. She redefined sacrifice the week my son was born, traded her sleep to hold my hand during labor pains, then forgot her own birthday so I wasn't left alone after birth. My, mother, my mother's lessons are in the way she cradles my son. They are in the sweetness of her voice when she tells him good morning. Her teachings live in the way she says yes to helping me no matter what I ask or when. My mother has taught me many of things, and I'm still learning how to absorb all of the lessons, how to hold on to all the memories with a full grip, like maybe if I can keep them alive, I can save her too. Thank you. So let's give up browsing. So I'm going to uh, finish up with a poem, um, and it's related to the turmoil in the world today. Um, a few years ago, my father passed away, and I um, decided to travel to his birthplace, which is in a small, tiny island in Greece. Uh, it's about 4,500 miles from here. The island is called Sifnos, and his village is called Castro, which was built in the 14th century. And it's pretty much the same. Um, it's, it was an incredible journey for, my, for me, because during the day, I would be walking the cobblestone streets and going to, you know, finding these secret passageways, and at night, I would go back to where I was staying, get on my computer, and I was back in the 21st century. So it's, it was a unbelievable mix, mixed feelings. But um, I'd like to think uh, my ancestors uh, guided my hand writing this poem. It's called Ancient Ruins. A day is but a moment among ruins. Ever-changing years seem to weave a seamless continuum of unbroken time over ancient broken sites. 
Yet why does the earth spin on its axis along the same sunny path? Why does this globe carry all our pieces in a closed loop? Sky blue and sky white mirror the sea, draw us into reflection, seducing us to delve into deep separate oceans to seek origin. But when do we truly look at each other as specimens of the species human? Are we evolving or devolving? Scholars remind us to learn from our past or be condemned to repeat it. What have we learned of science, mathematics, religion, philosophy, and greed? Who gave us opposable thumbs to crush the future? Who gave us tools to create? Oh my God, what have we given rise to? We call ourselves compassionate, humane, and intelligent as nations lay bleeding between fingers too tiny to hold the future. Why do so many hands squeeze out innocence in the name of what deity we? Why do we seek sanctuary in time of suffering, seek safe passage, refuge, and haven, but harbor leaders who turn eyes blind or away? Does Mother Earth feel her garden grow barren as her marrow is sucked out while crimes against humanity regenerates like an infectious cancer? We cry out animal at those who do us injustice. We snivel around mouthfuls of burnt fat and guzzled spirits as we dread the cries of the silence that speaks to us. Arms. Arms for the poor. And just where are we on the evolutionary scale? We wonder at ancient ruins and marvel at what was. I ask you, what do such acts foretell? Will there be anything to wonder of us? I wonder today among the ruins. So this has been a very wonderful, intimate, everyone has a voice. I want to thank Meredith Nussbaum from Brockton High, uh, our student feature, Dolore, yeah. uh, and importantly, his support group, his father, his mother, and sister. They all came to support him, so that's a wonderful you know, as I said, our future is in good hands. And, and a special thank you to Anita D for her honesty, her passion, and for her words, which gives everybody hope that you know, we can also go, move on. So we will be back next month, June 25th, our features will be Danielle Legros Georges. She is the former poet laureate of Boston uh, from 2015 to 2019. And our student feature is Tab Tara Agatha Vallon, who is a student at Boston College and, as always, a Brockton girl. So we will see you uh, Saturday, June 25th. Thank you. Have a great day. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Stroud, and I'm the head of adult services. And this is Delore, who nice was to meet you. who was our student poet for today. So, uh, Delore, when did you realize you wanted to be a writer? Well, I never thought of being a writer, but based on my experience, I was thinking of telling stories that that in that will, that I want to send a message that will inspire others. Like, for example, dreams, uh, identity, and yeah, all the, yeah, dreams and identities. All right. So, Delore, what does your family think of your writing? Well, basically, when I introduce them to 
wide world of story battles, they seem impressed, impressed about my creative writing skills. Nice. So would you say your idea of poetry changed since you started writing poems? Well, basically my idea about poetry is that I can create a story in like poetry form when it comes to like creating stories. All right. So what is the most surprising thing you've learned from writing your poetry? Well, basically the most a surprising thing for me is like, is that I can use poetry to express how I feel. All right. And then um, Delora, are you on social media? Well, yes, sir. Okay. And how would you say that affects your writing? Well, basically, it doesn't affect my writing, but I just type the poems that I wrote on paper okay. and share it to others. All right. So, if you could pass along one piece of, of advice for young writers, what would it be? Well, one piece of advice that I want to give to writers is to embrace how you feel and what you want to change in life. All right. Well, thank you, Delore. Hello. Uh, my name is Jonathan Stroud, and I'm the head of adult services. And this is our feature poet uh, for today, Anita. Hi. How are you doing, John? Hello. Doing well. So, Anita. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Um, so it was, it was, I was in high school. Um, my 10th grade English teacher, uh, Maura Goodhall at the time, um, her name is Maura Wolf now, um, she added poetry into the curriculum. And so, and it wasn't like, not all the English teachers were doing it. and. Uh, she ended up um, giving homework assignments, and so she hosted a couple like open mics in the classroom where we shared. And um, that was the first time I ever really, I guess, used my voice. And I realized that telling stories was like a powerful, like this is a way I could tell stories and express myself. Um, so I learned it in, in high school and it's all thanks to her. <laughs> so. How long would you say it took you to start sharing your poetry? Um, I did not, so I started writing when I was 15. I did not actually, outside of the classroom in 10th grade, I didn't actually perform any of my poems on a stage until I was 18 or 19 years old um, because I got peer pressured by friends. Um, but I had, uh, I was, went to school at Framingham State College. Um, my friend, ran the Black Student Union, so he hosted open mics, and so it was just like an easy way to get in there and get on stage and practice. Um, but it was, that was just like the first time I started doing open mics, finally. Right. So, how do you think you've evolved as a writer over these years? I think I have, um, I've just learned a lot more tools, like uh, writing tools. I've begun to use a lot more figurative language. My early work was just a lot of, um, it was very raw. There wasn't a lot of metaphors in it. Like it was a lot of storytelling, but there wasn't too much figurative language in there. And I've learned a lot of tools, um, like poetic tools that are, I learned in high school. I just didn't really bring with me <laughs> into college. And um, so I, you know, working with uh, mentors as I got older, um, and going into performance, I, I learned other tools and other ways to, to use my voice and my language to tell stories. All right, Anita. So you were talking a little bit about mentors. So yeah. can you tell us some of the influences that have inspired you as an individual? Um, so my, I'm lucky enough to have one of my mentors had been uh, Rudy Francisco, who was pretty famous in the poetry world. Um, he. Uh, um, he's published with Button Poetry as well, and uh, he's an amazing poet, uh, nationally known. Um, 
I lived in California for a long time, for um, about eight years. And so a lot of my mentors are San Diego and LA based, um, including Sheehan, who was uh, on All Deaf HBO like way back in the day. Um, and so I've just really been blessed with the people that I've been around and, um, you know, that were generous enough to share insight with me and coach me in times. Um, so they've definitely been influential in my life. All right. So with the evolution of social media, how has this platform affected your writing process? And would you say, is it for the better or is it a, for the worse? Um, I think it's a distraction. I <laughs> personally, um, it's for me, it's, I never really was a fan of social media and I felt like the need to keep up on social media because of my poetry and uh, you know, trying to have a career and everything and gain popularity and you know, all that. Uh, but it's just exhausting. And I've, <laughs> I've had friends tell me, you know, I need to share more of my writing and stuff. But um, I don't know, I just, I, be, I, feel, I just don't feel like it sometimes. And social media is weird to me. So um, for me, it's a distraction, but I know for others, it's, it's really, they've used it to, you know, as a platform to take their career to the next level. So I think big ups for them, but I, I don't like it. I'm not good on technology. <laughs> So, Anita, we were talking a little bit about your mentors. Mm -hmm. So for you, if you could pass along your advice for poets or anyone considering the arts, what would it be? I would, um, I would let them know to just lead with their heart. Um, you know, express what's on their heart. Don't try to fit a mold. Don't try to be like anybody else or anything else. Like, be your truest self tell your story, um, and honestly work on your craft. And I think if you do that, there's really no way to, to fail, you know? All right, thank you, Anita. No problem, thank you. You're welcome.